So, hi everyone. I'm the graveyard slot, or the keynote, depending on how you want to see it. Um, and I'm here back again in Newcastle. I've been up and down a few times over the last few years, and it's absolutely awesome to be back here, invited by Colin, because I owe a huge amount of my R journey to Colin Gillespie. Probably the first time you met me, I came on one of your more introductory courses. So um, what I'm talking about links to something that Thomas was saying, that sometimes it can seem really intimidating when you go and see that the kind of R pros or any kind of technical skill and you just think, I can't do this. I only started to write code uh, properly, I guess, in, my thir in the third year of my PhD. So I'm relatively new to programming and I very much am using it to try and solve real world problems and that's my main drive. It's not the turd, although I might try and be more turdy because I want to get more creative in my use of uh, programming. But it's really, it's quite kind of mechanistic. I'm trying to solve specific problems. But anyway, to cut a long story short, or cut the introduction short a little bit, um, I attended one of uh, Colin's courses um, and loads of light bulbs started going on in my head and I was like, ah, oh, I'm starting to get this. And then um, a few months later, I started writing code that was part of a project that was funded by the Department for Transport. So this was like a proper big contract that I had to deliver on. I, I found myself with limited programming experience as the lead developer on a project with a load of academics who have limited experience in transport to deliver a national, nationally scalable web application uh, for the Department for Transport. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, seems about the same answer as most of the big infrastructure Yeah, well, so I basically shat myself was the first thing. Uh, the second thing I did was uh, realise that I needed to get, take programming more seriously. I couldn't just write a load of spaghetti code and it would work one day and not work the other day and it didn't really matter. I needed to learn how to program. So. I attended um, Colin's um, course on building our packages, which is um, the, the way that I saw that I could get my code more robust and have a few tests in there. And maybe even, who knows, it might be useful for someone else. So that's really my uh, story of how I got into not art writing our code, which I did anyway, but our programming, which really allows you to do much more with the language. And Somehow, I'm still not quite sure how it happened, but I wrote a blog post about the R Packages course. Then we started collaborating, and then we ended up writing a book together. So that was um, a, a, an interesting pathway into it. But I think in a way, that process of writing the book, I was basically the documentation guy, and Colin was writing all of, a lot of the technical stuff in there. So we wrote this book called um, Efficient R Programming, and in a way, that book was the story of me teaching myself how to program po properly and forgetting all of the old bad um, practices that I'd learnt along the way. Um, I'm happy to say that this talk isn't about efficiency. I will touch on um, efficiency a little bit, but it's actually about um, something that I'm really interested in and goes back to my roots a little bit because I did geography um, as an undergraduate and I see myself as a geographer in the kind of broadest sense of the word and the reason why I did it when any, anyone asks is that geography is a subject that can link the kind of social and humanity side of things to the hard sciences and it's this like interface between the um, hard science on one side and the social on the other and I think programming is actually a way to help bridge that gap as well especially if you're communicating your results and trying to get them out there, there's a really good community around it. So anyway, two years down the line um, of working in this geospatial field, and we finally, finally got this book out. This is hot off the shelves. And um, I'm going to say, if, um, if I, assuming I get to the question stage, because I'm rambling a little bit, um, the best question will get this copy of the book. So that's something to look forward to. It's not my favorite one. Well, I should, yeah, if I brought a wheelbarrow in, maybe. But um, anyway, I'm rambling. So this talk is basically about geocomputation with R. I haven't seen many previous presentations at this session about geospatial, but R is really powerful language for doing um, working with geographic data. And the fact that it's also fantastic at statistics means that 
it, I'm pretty sure it's hands down the best environment to do geospatial statistical analysis in R, which is useful for a number of applications. So that's a, just a bit of the structure. I'm going to do an introduction, which is probably um, over already. I'm going to talk about um, some of the spatial packages that are available. I'm going to talk about the history and see how far we've come and um, do a little bit of a live demo, um, assuming there's time that kind of goes back in time to see how things were when people started making maps with R um, in the 1990s um, and then start thinking about what can we do next. <coughs> so um, about the book first, it was developed by um, myself and a guy called Janis, who's um, based in Nuremberg in Germany. He um, works at the University of Jena. And it was also by Jakub. And it started by a conversation between me and Jakub um, after doing a teaching course. So we both were teaching this stuff. And we were both thinking, wouldn't it be great if there was a better online resource for learning how to do spatial data in our both of us? had previously written tutorial material that we just got out there and put um, into the public domain. And we were both really surprised at how many people had started using and benefiting from our material. So we just joined forces and we said, OK, well, what, why don't we write a book together? Why don't we just start putting something together? So after meeting, we just started collaborating on GitHub and putting in issues and ideas. And it started rolling. And this is one of the amazing things about open source. If we'd just done it as a project where we were sharing the information with ourselves, that would have been great. But because it was out in the open, we were getting loads of feedback from the community. And one, of, one piece of feedback we got was a guy who just popped up one day on, Git, on um, GitHub and was like, oh, you need to have a chapter on bridges to GIS software. And we're like, why, why do we need that? And then he ended up writing the majority of a chapter for the book. And then the next thing, he said, oh, can I join you as an author? And again, my first reaction was like, no, we don't know who you are and we don't know where you're coming from. But then um, after speaking to him on Skype, we realized that he actually had loads of knowledge and experience that he could bring into the book. So he's um, the, an additional author that just emerged through the community which was really good. So he brings ecological expertise and also um, interfaces to um, GIS software, which is software that is dedicated to handling geospatial data. And I'm just going to plug in my laptop because it said I've got 10 minutes left. So that's probably... Um, that gives you lots of time now for us to ask great questions. Yeah, OK. Maybe that would be a good thing. OK, so... Um, and the next slide, well, the next thing is a map to show where we're all from. So we all love maps. That's something that unites us. And this also demonstrates the reproducibility element of it. So um, R is really fantastic at being able to do reproducible um, work. And this, these lines of code, anyone should be able, assuming you've got leaflet package installed on your laptop, you should be able to run this and you can pull down something online and just create a map really quickly. So um, that was about the book. Moving on to geographic data um, and linking back to kind of my journey in terms of learning R. As I said, I, I was learning R to solve a practical problem. And that is the propensity to cycle tool. And this is actually a screenshot of it running from Newcastle. And this. I'll, I'll do a very quick demonstration of it. So it's a web application, um, and it's based on Shiny, but we've done a few modifications to it, including this, the spinner that you can see at the beginning. I'm going to try and reduce the resolution of this, because it's... Um, and essentially what it does, there's loads of layers that um, people who are transport planning um, can use who, who are... Um, trying to design better transport infrastructure and specifically um, better cycle networks are using this. And um, a few weeks ago, we, did, we found out from one local authority, um, which was Transport for West Midlands, that this is being used to develop a £230 million cycle um, network. So 
this stuff um, is being used partly because we've given all, all of the data away um, as open data. So it's also a portal where you can download the results of a research um, problem, of a research um, project. So to cut to the chase, because I know time's of the essence, probably the most important layer in this propensity to cycle tool is this root network layer. And this, again, took a lot of work to create this map. This represents about 4 million routes across the UK. And this actually is, this is, this processing is done outside of Leaflet. And we had to generate these um, raster tile grid so that you could see it for anywhere in the country. But anyway, that's an example of the kind of things that you can do with geographic data. And if we'd done this model and we didn't represent the results on a map, it would have far less impact. So the main point, really, of, um, of that demonstration is to say that geographic data can be vital for your work having impact. And that especially applies to statistics, where you might have a global model that's literally global. It should work on... Uh, anywhere in the world, as well as the kind of modelling um, meaning of global. But if you can make it um, have local impacts and see what it can mean for local people, in this case, what's the rate of cycling along roads in Newcastle, then it's much more likely to have impact. So that's like a reason why, if, even if you're not interested in geographic data, that um, you might want to think about doing something with it. So... If I'm going to write a book called Geocomputation with R, we should probably think a little bit about defining uh, geocomputation. It's similar to data, the data science debate. A lot of people say, oh, I'm a data scientist. And then, the answer, and then you ask them, what is data science? And they're like, well, I don't really know. So we went back to the literature and looked up what, where does this word actually come from? And we took it quite seriously because it was invented by a guy um, called Stan Openshaw, and he was really passionate about um, making, uh, taking geography out of the dark ages and bringing it into the kind of computational world realm um, and about making it have impact. So we took inspiration from his words and then we added a few things onto it. So if you look at his books, which I don't expect many people have, but they're all about, oh, you can do all this amazing stuff. He was talking about neural networks back in the early 2000s, but none of it was reproducible. He'd include a little bit of Fortran code, but there's no way in hell that any one of us could reproduce it, and you weren't expect to, expected to. But things have changed. So back then, he was having to run those things on mainframe computers, on compiled Fortran, and there was no guarantee of reproducibility. So we've added on to this this idea of reproducibility, and not just reproducibility, accessibility. So if I create a presentation and I can run it on my computer, I would expect it, other people to be able to run that. And that's one of the really great things about the R community. It is accessible and it encourages uh, reproducibility. So uh, a broad definition of geocomputation is um, harnessing the power of modern computers to do things with geographic data. So again, like data science, it's not very specific, but it's a very applied uh, field that we're trying to encourage here. Um, so that's the definition that we've uh, got here, which is um, illustrated by one of the maps that um, you can re reproduce um, if you follow the book, which um, is based on this scenario of looking for ideal places to put um, a, bike, a bike shop across all of Germany, and this is done by converting loads of geographic data into raster grid cells of um, 20 kilometers, and then you zoom in into those areas, and you can really pinpoint the most potentially profitable locations to put your shop. So um, in terms of what's in the book, um, there's a whole range of stuff that basically is trying to get you started with geographic data. We do talk about the the history and a bit of the kind of philosophy behind um, geographic data in R. Um, we try to build on strong foundations, so starting from the beginning, imagining that you've never made a map in R before, and just building from these foundations upwards. And then the final part is about applications. And I think it's really important that if we're developing all this technology, 
we're thinking carefully, how is this going to be applied? How, who's going to benefit from it? So I take very seriously the uh, kind of policy relevance of the work uh, that we're doing. And I think geographic data um, is fantastic for having policy impact. Okay, so in terms of the broader context of um, geocomputation with R at the moment, things are evolving, like um, other presenters have said, and um, there's a trend towards grouping together packages. We saw that with the tidy models um, framework, uh, which is like a meta package for modeling. And we've also seen that with the tidyverse, which has become hugely successful. However, the spatial community has always been quite niche and hasn't joined on to this main tidyverse area. So that's the context in which um, this, uh, this book was written. Um, and I think there's been a shift away from just focusing on computational performance, and it doesn't matter what the function's called, and it doesn't matter how easy it is to write that code towards making it more intuitive. And that's something that I think the tidyverse is really good at doing. Um, but there's different types of efficiency, and that that's links to the idea that there's different types of efficiency. Um, on one hand, you've got the very obvious computational efficiency, how fast will the computer run? But then there's another type of efficiency that's often forgotten about that we talk about in the Efficient R programming book, which is um, your personal efficiency. So if the code runs super quickly, but it took you three hours to write it, that's um, worse than having code that took you one hour to write and then it runs in half an hour type thing. So it's about being able to get the problem solved quickly and to program the solution quickly. Okay, so, in, um, and R has moved forward hugely um, in respect to these things as it relates to the tidyverse. It's got much easier to solve quite complex problems. And that is also happening in the geographic data space. However, I would argue that geographic side of R has been slow to catch up in some ways. So um, you, um, geographic data was not really present um, in the origins of R. There aren't that many packages dedicated to R um, since before the 2000s. So interest really started growing since after 2000. And, um, and that's despite the fact that Brian Ripley, who's on our core team, um, was uh, behind some of the, the innovations. They didn't really focus on making maps or anything. So RGDAO was a big development in 2003, and that finally allowed people to read in a wide variety of uh, data sets into R. And then SP, which provided um, basic classes for representing spatial data was only published in 2005. And because that was the first time that you could have properly defined spatial classes, there was a whole ecosystem of packages that emerged around SP, um, which now all of the developers of these SP packages, including myself, are having to work really hard to transition everything to a new framework of doing things. And I'll, I'll come on to what that new framework is in a bit. And then you've got Raster, that was published in 2010. So quite late development, really, in terms of um, really mature spatial packages. Um, there's also been um, advances on the visualization side of things. And this statement was true when I started using R for geographic data. I used to do my modeling and analysis in R. And then for visualization, it was just rubbish. I had to export the data as a shapefile probably, then read it into a dedicated geospatial software like QGIS, and then make the maps that way. So this statement from a book in 2013 really admits, it says, hands up, R is not really very good at visualization. But only five years later, and this is from the book, which said, should actually say uh, 2019, um, we provide that example that I showed at the beginning that demonstrates this package called Leaflet, which was developed by RStudio employees, um, completely removes that barrier. So you can now create maps interactively, which is 
amazing. But before we go forward, sometimes it's useful to go backwards. And this is where the uh, live demo um, side of this comes in. So I'm going to try and reproduce um, an analysis that was done back in 1993. And this is nowhere near as ambitious as what Roger Bivan did. He did a live demo of the very first um, released version of R, which was 0.49, I think. But basically, if I get a terminal up, this is what you had confronting you. You just had this black screen and a terminal, and you had to try and figure out what to do in that um, space. So um, the first thing that you would do, obviously, with many projects, is um, learn, uh, load the package that you're interested in. Um, and in this case, um, it is SP Lanks. And it gives you some information, so that's useful. Spatial and space-time analysis. This is like going back in time, in a way. It's like a time machine. So, um, and we're going to load some data. So they had some data from a place called Bodmin. And um, RStudio has good auto-completion. The terminal also has some auto-completion capabilities, which is good. So we've loaded some data silently. And then we're going to create um, some plots that represent um, the, the points in, in uh, Bodmin. So let me just try and do that. So um, plot <laughs> Bodmin. Yeah, so that is the poly. And then I can give it an aspect ratio, which is very important in geographic data because you have a coordinate reference system. A map doesn't look right if, you, if it's squashed in one of the axes. And then um, finally, we can say type equals n, which means don't actually show it. So we're just opening up a plotting window that has the right coordinate reference system. So that's just setting up the plotting system without actually doing any plotting. And you can't see it, but it's opened up a plot on the other monitor here. OK, so the next thing that we want to do um, is plot that data. So let's go point map. So they created point, point map. And then you can't just plot the points directly. You have to convert them, which is a common feature of geographic data. And then add that to the existing layer. So um, error expected. Um, uh, okay, yep. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. So now, hopefully, I should have some points on a map. So this was kind of pretty, pretty close to the cutting edge back in 1993. And what was even more exciting is that you can interact with this map. So the level of interactivity that you had there was you had to enter a function to interact with it. So you say zoom, and then it, it gives you instructions. So I can zoom in. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on in this part of Bodmin. And then it zooms, and then you have to replot it again <laughs> and see what's changed. And yay, I've zoomed in. So that was what interactive mapping meant. Um, way back when, but, and there's a positive thing from this, which is now is a very good time to start using spatial data because you don't have to do all of that. So in addition, we can observe, we can take some positives from it. I think it's amazing that that still runs. Something that was written back in 1993 runs today on the latest version of R, and R core is famous for being conservative, and that's actually a good thing from the perspective of scientific reproducibility. If I want to reproduce the findings of that paper, I can, I can do that. So moving very quickly on. Um, we're in the 21st century now, and things have moved at a huge rate. So we can get data, not just from Bodmin, but from anywhere in the world, in literally a few commands. So there's a package called OSM Data, written by Mark Padgham, that allows you to 
query interactively OpenStreetMap data. So this example is something I put together for this, where you just create a query saying, give me all of the uh, green spaces, well, not all of the green spaces, but all of the OpenStreetMap uh, entities that are registered as parks in the Newcastle area, and it will go away and do that in a few lines of code, and it will give you an interactive map quite quickly. So I'm going to talk about that interactivity in a bit, which makes it a lot more user-friendly to work with <coughs> geographic data. And that's something we talk about quite a lot in the book. There's a whole book, uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to geographic data visualization. And you can do the same thing for transport data, which is something that I'm very interested in. So um, this is a package that we wrote to allow uh, easy access to transport data. Um, and all of this stuff is made possible by SF. So when I was talking about SP being this package that was released in 2005, SF replaces <coughs> SP and it basically combines the benefits of three big packages into a single package. So it really is a powerful framework that can do quite a lot of things. It's a class system, but it also has C++ backend, which allows it to read and write spatial data and do spatial operations on it, which is where RGEOS comes in. So um, usually this is the first thing that people want to do is read and write spatial data and it's much easier than what came before it. You just give it an object and then you give it a file name and you give the file name an extension and it will know automatically what you want to write it to. So a typical example is GeoJSON, which is probably the most common web uh, format for spatial data. You've also got G uh, GeoPackage, GPKG files, which is a binary compressed format for spatial data. So you can do that. The other really clever thing about um, the SF package is it combines um, your spatial data into a data frame. So a data frame is probably the most useful R class that there is. And um, in SF, the revolution was treating the geography just as another column. So it's a list column, and it's typically called geometry although you can call it different things. So this is really useful. If you've ever worked with data frames before, probably everyone in this room has done, you can work with geographic data. And the great news is it's compatible with the tidyverse. So I'm not going to do a live example of this, but I'm just going to demonstrate that you can do GIS operations um, and chain them together in a reproducible way that's compatible with the tidyverse. And as someone who does a lot of geographic work, this is really good. It's made my life a lot easier and is making many people's lives much easier. And it's also, um, yeah, it's also relatively high performance. So um, this is just an example. So that parks data set that I took and this um, zones data set that I read in on the fly for this presentation you can then do a geographic operation, and it's not a particularly sophisticated geographic operation, but it's saying, tell me all of the zones that are within a 50 meter buffer of a park. And you can imagine quite quickly that can start to get towards policy relevant um, analyses. So you can ask questions, and this is a geographic question of your data. Um, I've got a couple of gotchas. I could spend a lot of time talking about the subtleties of geographic data because it's um, not the same as non-geographic data. But the one thing that confuses a lot of people, myself included, is that um, a geographic entity, uh, when you have a single row of data, it can be one polygon or you can even have multiple polygons representing, uh, represented in a single row of data. So it's a good example is if you plot the country of France you'll get a map of the entire world in a tiny island somewhere in the southern hemisphere. And that's because the countries are represented in this multi-polygon format. And what you need to do is uh, break apart those multi-polygons into single polygons. So that's one thing to be aware of. Another one that gets every, everyone um, is coordinate reference systems. And to the extent that we've got, again, an entire chapter on coordinate reference systems in the book. So I'm not going to say more about it, but watch out for CRSs. So th these are all geographic things. But now, on something much more fun, which is geographic data visualization. So this is, again, an example 
on the book, uh, on the, in the uh, geographic, in the mapping uh, chapter. So you can access this online and there's a reproducible example where you can go ahead and create this. And this demonstrates state formation in the United States. So at the beginning, there aren't even states covering the entire area and then they gradually grow and they become more stable and then they grow in population. So it's a really great way of demonstrating the evolution of a country in this case, the, the US. Um, so that is with the TMAP package that I'll come back to later. Um, SF, which is the package that I mentioned previously, does plots. Um, I commented it out because it was crashing my slides, but basically it's fast and it creates small multiples, which means um, it creates a new map for every variable that you've got. So if you've got three variables in your data frame, you'll be able to see the geographic distribution of each of those. And it's probably worth going back to one where it was working. And it's interesting, you can't see all of the region in this case, but you can see that, as you would expect, people who are going by foot, um, or zones where more people travel by foot, are much more common near the city centres. That's actually Newcastle city centre, that area of yellow, whereas car driving is much more common in rural areas. So that's um, a great feature of SF. And I'm just going to talk about a few more. I have to include ggplot2, um, not only because Thomas is in the room, but because it is a really powerful framework for making maps. And you can have all the power now of the syntax of ggplot2 plus the um, integration with geographic data. So you, there's a new geom called geomsf, which allows you to do that. So um, all of that is good, but if I want to communicate with the public and get it out there, I need interactivity. So that's where Leaflet comes in, which is actually the name of a JavaScript library, um, and it's also the name of an R package that wraps around it. And Leaflet code looks something like this, and I'm not actually sure why that one's not showing, but that should show you an interactive map of the same data. The one that we use most commonly in the book is Tmap, which is quite a general purpose uh, map making package. And it's got an, a syntax that's similar to ggplot2, but it was specifically designed around maps. And one of the amazing things about Tmap is that you can give it exactly the same code and it will create an interactive map and a static map. And I don't know of any other mapping package that has that capability, except maybe Plotly does some, some stuff like that. But usually I just default to these interactive maps. So you can have a look around and you can kind of validate and see if these, um, the, the input data makes sense. If you want to get a little bit more exotic, you can even do, you can now do these 2.5D type graphics with um, relatively few lines of code. So this is from the map deck um, package and this was developed by Uber, so it's relatively high performance and you can create these kind of 2.5D representations. Again, I'm not quite sure why it's not um, working in this case, but we do have an example from the geocomputation with our book that shows um, an example across uh, where it scales across the UK. If I can... That's Shiny App one. That's the Leaflet one. This is the, this is the example. And again, there's a reproducible example um, that you can run that will generate that on your computer. How much time do I have left, by the way? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to move quickly on. Um, there's Shiny, if you want to start to deploy not only build maps, but deploy them. And the leaflet package is compatible with Shiny. So we use Shiny um, in the propensity to cycle tool, and that was me. Uh, demonstrating it to Chris Grayling, who's uh, actually not, not famous for good reasons at the moment, but he, and he's not a big fan of cycling, but he loved this app. He was like, that's a cool data app. So I got to show it off to the minister, and this is uh, being used by local authorities. I think it's fair to say we pushed Shiny to the absolute limit, and the other day we did a kind of a, a big demonstration and it was um, pushing the limits of what you can do with Shiny. So 
Shiny's great with apps, it, um, and we were using HA proxy to load balance, um, but, and we have a, a few instances of it, but um, there's other things that you can do. So this is really a prototype package called GeoPlumber that is basically Plumber, um, but handle it for handling geographic data. So it allows you not only to serve the data, uh, sorry, not only to serve an interactive web map, but the underlying data via API. So it integrates with the Swagger compliant API that, um, Pl that Plumber has developed. And that's been developed by my colleague, Layek Hammer. So in terms of um, what next, we've written this book. Um, that's not to say that this will always be the most cutting edge um, stuff in R for spatial data, but it's pretty up to date and we intend to keep it um, at least running on the latest versions of all these packages. But there's quite a lot of movement going on in the spatial ecosystem. And one thing that I deliberately haven't talk, talked about in this slides is uh, raster data, which is really common for remote sensing. So stuff like elevation data, if you've got satellite imagery, it will generally be this raster type data. And I would say this is one area in um, spatial packages that is moving very quickly and it's difficult to see which way it's going to go because there's quite a few packages out there. One thing that I can say for sure is check out another open source book on the topic by Edza Pabesma who developed a lot of the um, spatial packages. So he describes in quite a lot of detail this new package called STARS which is for working with not just raster data but spatio-temporal arrays of data. So that's um, one area where there's a lot of development happening. Also something that I believe Thomas is interested in is um, spatial networks. So if you have a street network and you want to know, for example, the connectivity of different places or the centrality um, between them, um, you can represent that as a graph but you can also represent it as a spatial object. So this, this kind of duality between the two um, ways of representing the data. Uh, it's not quite like a photon in that it's a wave and a particle at the same time, but it's still got this weird duality to it. And there's different ways of doing it, and it's not clear which one um, works, that, uh, which one will be kind of the optimal in the future. So that's another one that's up in the air. Um, but with two minutes to go, so this is definitely coming to a conclusion. Um, there's definitely, I think, leverage points, not just within the R community, but within the entire kind of geographic data analysis field. And as an R user, or as R users, we're quite niche in the wider kind of geospatial data analysis um, field. So I think that R can really help in terms of visualizing data the visualization stuff that's going on in R is amazing, and it's increasingly being applied to um, spatial data. I'd say MapDeck and this GeoPlumber package, which is not on CRAN yet, um, are two good examples that show what we can do. Um, and that, that visualization side of things really links in with making data come alive to the public. We can understand data as data analysts, but the only way that you can get it out there to the public is by visualising it. So I think um, the emphasis on visualisation is really important. And I think geographic data can really help um, bring, out, bring about what it means for you. All of this data science stuff um, is good, but what does it mean to us? And I think geographic data can help um, answer some of those questions. Like, what's the most dangerous road in Newcastle? We could use some of these geographic data techniques to answer that question. Um, and there's stuff about community cohesion, and I think that all of these things um, are issues that the R community is very well suited to tackle. So, in summary, it's about doing things with um, geographic data. It's not just about making pretty maps and having fun, it's about actually changing the world. And that is what we have the capability to do with data science. We, we have um, a huge amount of power at our fingertips and I think putting it on a map can really help emphasize that. And if I had to, I tried to summarize all of this 
into a single slide. If you want to get into geographic data, I would install the SF package, um, install the raster package for now, if you want to do um, raster data analysis and start checking out some um, freely available data examples and just have a play. So I think that's it from me and leaving time for some questions. So thanks a lot.